Wiring up the layout is often a disliked aspect of a model railway project. Cables or bundles of wire are difficult to keep organised and can spoil a great attempt at a tidy, realistic trackside scenery. Links between things can also be frustratingly difficult to work out when designing and developing a railway layout. For indoor layouts, away from the dirt and water, all these are hard enough, but at least if the underside of the trackboard is accessible, all the messy wires can be left hanging and dangling underneath. Outside, though, with the added weather and other factors, the level of difficulty and challenge only increases. But I relish the challenges, and for me, all these are important parts of designing and building the Linley's Garden Railway. Hi, I'm Warren Brand, and in a short series of videos over the next few months, I'd like to explain my approach to cabling up my garden railway in ways that keep all the electrical cables hidden for the most part, so they don't spoil the trackside scene. Getting to grips with the basics, just for a moment, it's worth checking out the various aspects of a typical railway layout which needs cabling up. I think there are three main aspects, each possibly separate in their cabling, or combined in a complex DCC system, but each working in unison together. Firstly, the track power. Irrelevant for battery and remote control systems, or for live steam running, but otherwise track power is a must and needs careful planning and installation. I'll focus on that topic more in a moment. Secondly comes the control lines, radiating out from the central control system. These are vital for layouts which have more complex operational features such as multi-train operation points, block sections and automation. And thirdly, there are the local connecting wires going out to each of the individual pieces of trackside equipment, such as the point motors themselves, signals, lamps and other such things. Although each railway layout is different, whatever the control system is used, there are just a few ways that the main track power is arranged for scale railways. DC or direct current feed is widely used on older traditional systems. This system uses a regulated power feed of somewhere between 12 and 22 volts, which is fed directly to a track layout through a power controller. The controller could be a basic old rheostat or a more modern solid state voltage current controller. With this, there's one track circuit, one control knob, one train, that's it. DCC, or Digital Command Control, is a more complex train control system, but as a simple description, uses an always-on live track at a constant voltage, which has an overlaid control signal added to the track circuit. A train controller will broadcast coded commands out via the live track and a decoder module on each train detects these instructions and responds accordingly. One track circuit this time with one control unit can control multiple trains on the line as long as the operator is quick at watching and adjusting each. Well, so what's the deal with my approach to track power cabling? In previous videos, I've described a little of how the DLC, or Decentralised Logic Control System, works. So in this video, I'll share my strategy for installing the track power cabling on the Lindley's Garden Railway. Practically, it's more complex than the basic DC cable system, but easier to plan than the DCC system. It is also more resilient to being installed in the garden layout, left outside all year round. Each line on the railway is divided up into physical block sections of about 6 metres in length. Some are a little longer. 
At the ends and between each of these block sections, there's a power gap. The rails are electrically decoupled using insulator frogs. I decouple both the inside and the outside running rails, although for the most part doing that on both is perhaps unnecessary. I use the Pico insulation frogs, like these, instead of the usual metal ones. They're not quite as strong, but with careful placement they do work a treat. On the track side, I mark the insulator locations with white discs so I can easily spot their positions, useful for fault finding. If you've not seen any of my previous videos which explain the control system I've developed, I recommend popping back and taking a look in this playlist. If you're interested in knowing more about my garden railway, please do consider subscribing below if you haven't done so already. And if you have, I hope you continue to enjoy my videos. If you've got a suggestion, please do let me know. Each block section has an associated control module and this can control a single train which is permitted in that section. Between each module and the nearby track, I just use a pair of 24 by 0.2 mm flexi leads, both black to be a bit stealthy through the cable pipes and track bed grooves. Sometimes these cables are separate from the other wires, but often they're bundled together and a whole cable is bound up with black electrical tape. I've planned a video on how I make these cable bundles, so look out for that. There are usually a few block sections in an area of the garden railway layout, and in this example are kept in a signal box unit. There are four modules here for the four block sections in the area of Woodgate Crescent Station. Each module in the box is fed by a regulated 22 volt supply with short circuit and over current protection. The main track power feed to the signal box is provided by a hefty cable tucked away deeply in the below ground cable trunking. I've shared a video about some of these tubes and pipes so please do grab that from the playlist. There is more to explain and in later videos I'll share how I link up the control modules in a way which forms the DLC or Decentralised Logic Control System of the Lindley's Garden Railway. Thanks for watching and bye for now.